So today we've got Dr Nicholas Patchter talking uh, about the if, how and when our, our family history affects our risk of cancer and when it's necessary to consider genetic testing. Dr Patchter is a consultant clinical geneticist at Genetic Services of Western Australia located next to King Edward Memorial Hospital. Dr. Patchter's interests lie in the diagnosis and management of inherited cancer syndromes. He is the lead clinician of the Familial Cancer Program of the Genetic Services WA and chairs the Familial Cancer Special Interest Group of the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, also called COSA. Dr. Patcher also spends time in the research of inherited cancer syndromes and is a chief investigator of the Inherited Cancer Connect National Collaboration. So we're delighted that he's made time today in what has been really busy, um, it's been eye-opening actually, how busy his clinical load is and how uh, precious those time slots are so that we've been able to get him today has been really, we're very thankful. So please join me now in welcoming Dr Nicholas Patchter for his support and his presentation today for the Cancer Update 2015. Thank you, Melissa, for that introduction, and welcome all of you. And um, if anything, hopefully today you uh, learn a little bit about um, our approach and what we do in uh, the familial cancer program. To look at the actual question, it's really difficult to answer that in, in a couple of sentences or even in, probably in a lecture. But what I want to do today is, is to take you through a journey, uh, I guess, of discovery, try, going back to first principles and really understanding what cancer cancer genetics is about, and then particularly the inherited cancers, and then how we apply that knowledge to family trees and making an assessment, and then just at the end a little bit about what we do, and then finally I'll actually try and answer the question. So a basic overview, we're looking at genes and cancer, then the principles of inherited predisposition, there are a few things that are important to know, then looking at an, acquire, um, an approach to inherited breast cancer, and an approach to inherited bowel cancer. Those would be the two main areas that we spend most of our time working on. A little bit about the familial cancer program, and then I will, as I said, answer the question from my opinion. Okay, so starting with some basics, first of all. So hopefully you can go back to your school days or early times and, and, and remembering a little bit about cell and chromosomes and DNA. And I guess what I, I just want to talk a bit about first and find the, is to start with the, the basic cell structure. So we have millions and millions of cells in our body, and each cell, believe it or not, has a copy in the nucleus of the entire bl blueprint of what that cell is meant to do and how it's meant to interact with every other cell. That blueprint is really written in, in DNA or genetic material, and that DNA is divided into genes, which are units of, of information. And then genes are really just beads of information on DNA that are wrapped up very tightly, coiled up into structures that we can see under the microscope called chromosomes. So the chromosomes are then housed in the cell. So to try and sort of put it in more simple terms, if you think about our entire contents of the nucleus of our cell, the DNA contents, really, is being our book of life. In other words, all the information is contained within two volumes. One volume you would get from your mother and one volume you would get from your father. And you can see that we have, in each volume, there were going to be 23 chapters, each chapter representing a chromosome. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. <clears throat> Now, as I said, all of this material is made out of the basic structure DNA. So DNA is a molecule. The molecule has, a, a, I guess, this spiral helical pattern that can be coiled tightly, much like those spring things that you can push, push together very tightly such that it's coiled up and can all fit into a cell. The important bit about DNA is that it has these interconnecting bands, and these are the really important bits. These are these backbones that are made up of four different what we call bases or nucleotides. And these are the code. This is the code that the cell reads to, to interpret and, uh, and identify what that, that particular cell needs to do. So our entire DNA building block is made up of combinations of these four different nucleotides. 
The nucleotides themselves are read in a series of three, one, two, three, and we call that a codon. Each codon, each combination of letters, will code for a specific amino acid. Now, an amino acid is the building block of a protein, and that's how the cell makes its function, through proteins. Proteins are the molecules that will interact, move around the cell, move out of cells, and have a, a function. So those are the building blocks. So going back to our, our volume, our, our textbook of information, each we've talked about 23 chapters. Each gene is like a page out of that textbook. Some, some chapters will have large numbers of pages and others will be shorter, just depending. Not all the chromosomes have the same number of genes. And then simply the code is just written out and is followed in order along as you can see. Now, genes themselves actually are made up of both coding and non-coding parts. The coding parts are called exons and the non-coding parts are called introns. And what happens is that the actual coding part is pulled out of the original reading frame and translated into a, a molecule called RNA which only contains the exons. The RNA is then translated into the protein and the protein then has a function in the cell. So just to give you an example here, and then there are a series of stop and start. So it's an interrupted reading frame, if you like, that requires the integrity of these codes to be intact as well. But here, for example, so in this message, this is your gene, this sentences would be your RNA, and so you pull out this coding bit, you pull out that coding bit, you pull out that coding bit, and you end up with your reading frame of one, two, three. Now, the basis of human disease, or a lot of human disease, much of human disease, is really errors in that reading frame. So we call that scientific term as a gene mutation. And you get different types of mutations, but all of them can lead to problems with protein production and therefore a problem with the cell and its function. So just in a couple of examples here, you can see underlined that code was meant to be a T, a C, and an A and it's been changed, and that will lead to a different amino acid being coded, and that could, depending on its location, change the entire structure of the protein and make it non-functional or reduce its function or give it a new function. Other types of mutations will be where a whole section is removed, this just drops out, or the opposite, you can have a, an insertion, an extra bit put in, and again, that can disrupt the reading frame. Um, there are also types of mutations where you get extra copies, there's sort of almost like the, the play button is put on and you get that stutter, stutter, stutter with a record and you can get extra numbers of certain codons as well and that can lead to problems as well. Okay, so I'm going to make the very profound and, and quite arguable statement that all cancer is genetic. And just to illustrate what I mean by that is if you think of the cell or the body as being a fine-tuned car, you need all of the genes involved in, I guess, cancer protection to be working in, a, in good functional order in order to, to prevent cancers from occurring. And there are gr different groups of, I guess, cancer-protecting genes. There are tumor suppressor genes, which really are the brake on the cell. If that, cell, if that car tries to go too fast, go out of control, you can apply the brakes. The mismatch repair genes are really like copy copy reading or proofreading, you're going through and you're correcting errors because remembering our cells are constantly dividing and making copies of themselves. There are going to be errors here and there. It's just part of, I guess, human nature, human fallibility. But there's actually a repair mechanism that will go in and try and repair some of these errors to prevent transcribing errors. So they, they keep the car running smoothly. And then oncogenes are actually genes with additional new functions, also through mutations, that try and promote tumour Genesis, so they will try and push the car. So you've got a balance of these forces. And if you look at cancers, all cancers are really a series of events in a particular cell, a build-up of DNA mutations at different sites, at different types of tumor suppressor genes or mismatch repair genes or oncogenes that eventually, stepwise, over time, over gradual, I guess, exposure to environment, over aging can lead to an accumulation where the body just cannot cope anymore and the cancer 
wins out, the growth leads out. So cancer is really just when a cell begins to grow autonomously on its own without being kept in check by the body. Just to show you in a, in a diff, slightly different way, because remembering you're going to have two copies of every gene at a particular locus. And in this example, we're just saying that there are six, for example, cancer protection genes on four different chromosomes. The truth is there are a lot more. Um, one copy then is knocked out, and slowly you're starting to build up, um, I guess, a, a drive towards a cell becoming cancerous. But at this point in time, there's still enough regulation to keep things in check. But as more and more mutations build up, more and more of these tumor suppressor genes are knocked out, and eventually you lose the control and the cell becomes cancerous. So what I want to qualify the earlier statement is to say is that what I've shown you is that all cancer is genetic, but it's acquired genetic. In other words, that individual cell was not set up or conceived or established with, those, with the DNA faults. They occurred over time. They were acquired. Acquired changes imply that they are not hereditary. What we deal with in cancer genetics are changes that were there at conception and are potentially hereditary. So most cancers are not inherited. So just to show you that a little bit further, on the left, I'll give you an example of what we call a somatic mutation. And everything I showed you in the previous slides are what we call somatic mutations. In other words, they've occurred in a particular cell in the body. They're not throughout the body. For example, in this picture, we've seen a breast cell. For whatever reason, aging, exposure to something in the environment, um, develops a series of mutations to allow it to become cancerous and it grows out of check. The rest of the body does not contain those mutations and hence the cancer develops there. That's the primary site of the cancer. Once a cancer spreads out of the tissue that it's born out of, it can then spread to the rest of the body. We call that metastases, and that can do so either through the blood or the lymphatic system. Um, so that's really when we're talking about advanced cancers. But the original mutation occurred in a particular cell, a somatic mutation. In familial or inherited cancer, what we're talking about is germline mutations. In other words, in either the sperm or the egg that went to conceive that individual, a gene mutation was passed on. It was there right at the beginning of life at the first cell stage, and therefore a copy of that faulty gene is in every cell of that person. So the question then is, well, why doesn't that person immediately begin to get cancer? Every cell is, has a faulty copy. Well, it comes back to a, a, f a few things. I'll, I'll actually get on to that. Well, this, this, I guess, demonstrates it. If somebody has it in every cell, why then is inherited cancer rare? I just wanted to show you in this picture that this is on breast cancer. Hopefully you can read it on this side. 10% um, of the population will develop breast cancer. So that's here. And only a small percentage, about 5 to 10% of it, that's demarcated in grey, will be due to an inherited cause. So if you look at the whole population, only a small proportion will have breast cancer due to an inherited cause. I've shown the example as well for ovarian cancer, where, the, first of all, the proportion of the population that will actually get ovarian cancer is much smaller, only about 1% of the population. And then, out of them, 1 in 10 or 10% of ovarian cancer is thought to be genetic. So the proportion of ovarian cancer that's genetic is significant, much more significant, but if you look at the overall scheme of things, it's still pretty unusual to have an inherited ovarian cancer within the context of the population. So just to say that, yes, yeah, so why, there are these individuals who are walking around with a faulty gene in every copy of their, uh, every cell, why is familial cancer so rare? And I guess we just need to go through some of the principles of an inherited cancer to understand that. So we'll come back to our well-oiled car example where we've talked about... Um, the various factors that keep, keep cancer in balance. Now, the fundamental inherited cancer is really due to mutations in any of these types of genes. We have approximately 23,000 genes in each cell, so the 23 chromosomes, 23,000 genes, and there are probably a good few hundred genes that, that regulate cancer control. So mutations either in tumor suppressor genes will cause inherited cancer, mutations in the mismatch, the DNA repair genes, 
And then with oncogenes, you actually you can have mutations, but they're not mutations that stop the gene from functioning. They actually give it a new function. So an oncogene doesn't exist in normality. It, it requires a mutation to enhance its function. So one of the fundamental principles for why we don't see a lot of inherited cancer is really what we call this two-hit hypothesis. So I'm going, I'm going to show you the example of a car, but suffice to say, for every gene we've talked about, remembering there need to be two copies. We're saying that somebody who has an inherited predisposition carries a, a faulty copy in one, but you actually require a hit in the second copy of that gene in order to, for the cancer to occur. And we showed you in the earlier slides how you need a build-up of DNA mutations where well, you need a second hit in exactly the same gene to lose that function. Otherwise, you can actually run on, on half the function. So the second mutation is really the key. And this second mutation is the same as in the general population. In other words, it's a chance event. It's related to aging. It's related to um, potentially environmental factors, toxins. Uh, I guess it's, it's complicated. But the point is, even someone with a predisposition in one copy is not guaranteed or, or resigned to get cancer, but it depends on chance events. Having said that, having one already pushes you along, you know, a lot further along the way. So the same example here with the car. You, you can travel fine with one, but as soon as you knock out both, you lose all your brakes. So instead of having some brakes, you've now got no brakes, and then the car moves into the cancer realm. So we call this two-hit hypothesis, Knutson's two-hit hypothesis, and it's a fundamental of, of inherited cancer genetics. So somebody will have one mutation, and it requires a second hit to cause the tumour. So just to summarise Knutson's hypothesis again, and the, and the principles, a cell can initiate a tumour only when it contains two mutation alleles. A person who inherits a mutant allele must experience a second and then a somatic, so only in that tissue, mutation to initiate the cancer. And then importantly, that people who do have an inherited cancer will they'll often develop more than one because they're primed or predisposed. But also the, the opposite, I've added this into the slide, that people with inherited mutations may never develop cancer for the reasons we've seen. Now... We talked about tumor suppressor genes and DNA repair genes and oncogenes. Now, they, nearly all of them follow this sort of inheritance, so what we term autosomal dominant inheritance. Remember, we talked about two copies of every gene. Let's say in this example, the dad happens to be the carrier of the mutation in the cancer predisposition gene. The copy in marked in black, the, the D, the big D, is the dominant or the gene mutation that we are dealing with. But remembering there will be a second normal copy of the gene. Miss, the mum is healthy, no cancer history in her family. She has two normal copies of the gene. On average, half the, the offspring of an, an adult who is a gene carrier will inherit the faulty gene. It's simply a 50-50 depending on whether you pass that one or that one because you will pass half your genetic material onto your children. So it's really, on average, one in two. And when we reflect and look at a family tree... A family tree with autosomal dominant inheritance will really look something like that. Generational spread of the condition, in this case, inherited cancer. So cancer seen from one generation to the next, from one generation to the next. There will be those that are affected, there will be those that are unaffected. And then unaffected people will not pass it on because they don't carry the faulty gene, and affected would have a 50-50 chance of passing it on. I want you to have a picture of this sort of family tree in your mind because that's going to be our driving principle when we assess family histories for uh, predisposition to cancer. And I've just given some examples early on here, but we'll talk specifically for, for breast and bowel cancer as well. So really what, what you want to be thinking about is clustering of the same cancer type. So there, the genes tend to cause the same types of cancer, with breast cancer and bowel being the commonest and that the clustering really needs to be from generation to next, so really across three or more generations. There are some associated cancers that we make links with, so for example, breast and ovarian cancer do go together. The other important factor is the young age of onset. So relative to the general population where you require the two hits, in other words, you have to have two random events over time in the same faulty gene, a person who's got one hit already is primed or predisposed, so they just require the second hit. So we do still see younger age of onset cancer. 
and I will give you some guides as well to age. Then if one individual has multiple cancers of the same type, that's certainly a concerning factor. And finally, if a young individual has multiple cancers of different types, particularly when they're associated, such as breast and ovarian cancer, that's another warning sign. I think I was meant to have a pretty red flag up there as a, as a red flag, but that hasn't come up. Now, what I want to move on to next is the concept of genetic testing and how we apply it and who we apply it to and what its role is. So what I actually tell patients that I see is that genetic testing is really like looking at a needle in a haystack. It's a very difficult process. I've said to you there are literally there are 23,000 genes, hundreds of which have been described in inherited cancer. You need to recognise, or we need to recognise, the pattern that that particular family represents in order to know which gene to select. And then even when you select a gene, you've seen that, that a gene is a page full of writing in a textbook that requires very careful analysis and looking at difference to normal. So genetic testing is, is prone to, to, I guess, missing things. We don't tend to overcall things, but we do tend to miss things. So with genetic testing, as I've shown you, you really want to select the individual that's highly likely to carry a change in the family. So it's, it needs to be someone who's actually affected with the cancer. You can't test an unaffected person if you haven't established the genetic cause in the family. So we call that diagnostic testing. I've said that you have to very carefully select families that fit patterns that we've seen before um, in order to get the most meaningful information. Otherwise, you get results that you just cannot interpret. We tend to choose the person that's usually the youngest or has multiple count cancers as the most likely individual. And I guess I'll give the example as breast cancer. A 10% population has breast cancer. That's the approximate risk in the Australian population. There's a fair chance in a family that someone who's got breast cancer, particularly if it's older, may just be one of those 10% and not an inherited cause. So you need to select. You can't just take the first person that necessarily comes to see you. You may have to say, look, we, we need to test your, your child, your niece, your nephew, someone who's perhaps had it younger where it looks more likely to be genetic. And then we have to target only the genes that we think explain the family history because if we look at all of them or if we, even if we select the few hundred that we know of, we're going to get uninterpretable results. We're going to get too much information that we can deal with. So we, we need to be targeted. Otherwise this happens. We get a whole lot of information that comes out of our genetic testing that we can't interpret. So careful selection is the key. And I guess I should add that that it's such the specialization is such and that's why you will find that if you go to your GP or elsewhere they have to refer you on to us for genetic testing because it, it really is the interpretation of the information that requires our input now what are the outcomes of genetic testing so if you this is for someone who's test being tested in the family that no one's had testing before you find a mutation this will explain the family history, so the gene fits the family history, it fits the characterization. This is really key, and I'll talk about this a bit more. This will then allow the unaffected people in the family to have what we call predictive or pre-symptomatic testing. And this is one of the main roles of genetic testing, is we can then identify other family members at risk. And if you remember the, the autosomal dominant tree that I showed, some are going to have it and some are not. So we can clarify the risk for those that have it. They know they're at higher risk, whereas those that are negative and don't have it can actually be ruled out. You can ignore the family history. So that's the great utility of genetic testing. However, we may get a result where we don't find anything at all. Uh, and as I've said to you, genetic testing is prone to missing things. Maybe we've missed something because we are starting to discover that you get rare gene mutations in the non-coding, in those introns of genes, which we're not currently looking at. Perhaps uh, there could be another unknown gene that's causing a similar presentation. So we never say that there is not a genetic cause if we don't find anything. We just say we haven't found it at this particular point in time, and unfortunately we can't offer testing to other family members. The third one is that mess of information that you saw on the slide before. We find a, a result that we're just not sure what it means, uh, and that's very difficult to conceptualise because we'll report to you that we found something but we don't know what it means and we can't use it to guide testing of other family members or making decisions. So this is the, the predictive testing that I was talking about, really going through. So in red, if you've got the gene mutation, 
50-50 chance of passing it on. So for, for the next generation of family that has testing, it's going to be an all or nothing result. It's going to either be positive, you do carry the inherited gene fault or gene mutation. In other words, you have an increased chance of cancer. You can make decisions around your health. We'll talk a bit about that. Or, and then your children moving forward would have a 50-50 chance. But if you test negative, those two situations, you've not inherited the gene fault, your risk of cancer is not increased, and therefore you're safe and you cannot pass it on to your children. Now another something that's becoming more and more um, certainly of interest to our patients is avoiding passing on a particular gene mutation to, to your offspring. So one method of doing that is to use IVF, in vitro fertilization, and create embryos. This is a picture of an embryo arrested at about a six cell stage. It can be frozen and safely implanted at a later stage. But if you knew you were carrying a gene mutation, you could ask for your embryos to be tested this is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. One or two cells are removed from that embryo. The embryo is still absolutely viable and fine. And we can do our genetic testing to see whether it's got the mutation or not. And then only implant embryos that don't carry the mutation, thereby guaranteeing or avoiding transmission. So that is something that we are being asked about from time to time. There are, of course, a number of ethical and other factors around it, but we have a, a, a frank discussion uh, and before, um, and in fact, for any couple that goes through PGD, they will need to have input from a, a team of doctors and scientists to, to allow the go-ahead. So with those broad principles in mind, I want to talk a little bit about um, in approaches to inherited breast cancer. This is, would be the commonest types of family histories that we would see in our clinic, is families with breast and ovarian cancer, or and or ovarian cancer. So <clears throat> I would have thought most people in the audience have at least heard about the BRCA, or commonly called the BRCA genes. And I've put uh, in the corner there a particular lady who has certainly made them very popular. And I'm going to come back to her, actually, because she's having quite a profound effect on our, on our familial cancer program. So Angelina Jolie obviously came out a few years ago saying that she carried a BRCA mutation and that she was going to have a bilateral mastectomy. And then just in the last few months, she's also now mentioned that she's had her ovaries removed as well. So BRCA stands for breast cancer genes, and there are two breast cancer genes. They are tumor suppressor genes, and of course, so their job is to protect us from developing cancer. What I want to show you is, again, that and we've shown this in an earlier slide. This is just a different way of showing it. These are all people with breast cancer and ovarian cancer, that the proportion of those that will have cancer due to a single inherited cause is still very small, that 5 to 10% figure. About half of that 5 to 10% is made up of the BRCA genes, and the other half are a, a group of genes that we're starting to learn a little bit about, but they are individually very, very rare. And I have to say, a lot of this is still also unknown, so there are many cases out there that remain unsolved. Oh, so the red flag came out in this one. So bearing in mind your family tree again. So what are the indicators of a possible inherited uh, predisposition to breast ovarian cancer? In other words, how do we look at a family and say, okay, there could be a BRCA mutation. Let's, let's investigate. Let's do genetic testing on this family. So again, multiple breast cancers in the family. And I've put a little star here, three or more as a guideline. It, it also depends on the age of the onset of the cancers and how closely related they are. Uh, I mean, if you take a family that's big enough, you're bound to, to see three breast cancers, but they're probably going to be older age of onset and, and more what we call the sporadic or the somatic mutations. But again, okay, just bearing in mind that these, imagine that these were females, so these were round. For those that didn't know, round is female, square is male. So just pretend that these were all females for now because we don't often see male breast cancer. But if you did, it's a very important factor for a BRCA mutation. But... Again, it's that generational spread, one generation to the next, siblings being affected, parents, uncles, aunts, close relatives, and quite a few occurring in the family, all of the same cancer type. Now, not, not really your job, but our job to recognize that there are certain types of breast cancer, in other words, pathology of the breast cancer that is linked to BRCA genes, and in particular, the so-called triple negative, where the hormone receptors are, are negative, is an indicator. 
We've talked about one person having more than one breast cancer in their lifetime. So they got one at a young age and then a few years later, not talking about that cancer coming back or metastasizing or spreading. We're talking about that individual being cured of their initial cancer and it coming back again. In other words, what I mean is they get a new cancer. So often on the other breast, for example. So I've talked about male breast cancer. Now, background is important, but it's, um, there are certain conditions that are prone to people of certain ethnic groups. And for breast cancer, the Ashkenazi Jewish ethnic background is a, is a red flag. So particularly if there's a, a family history of breast or ovarian cancer in someone of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, there are specific changes in the BRCA genes that we can look for in this group. So that's certainly a red flag. Now with the BRCA genes, it also causes ovarian cancer, and so we see both breast and ovarian cancer in the family. That's a red flag, particularly, again, if the age is young. And you can see that for breast, we're really talking under 40. For ovarian, under 60 is considered young. Again, there are certain types of ovarian cancer, certain types of pathology. Anybody who's had both breast and ovarian cancer is a red flag, and once again, the Jewish heritage. So those are the sorts of things we would look for. We actually, in, in the Familial Cancer Clinic, we actually have uh, a number of algorithms and programs that are actually generated to take into account both affected and unaffected family members. And we actually generate a likelihood, a percentage of detecting a BRCA mutation. And it seems to be uh, certainly nationally recognized if that percentage is 10% or more, we will offer testing. So you can see that our detection rate is only 1 in 10, so most of the people that we would test are still not going to carry a BRCA mutation. But we, we're trying to be as inclusive as we can while limited in terms of the amount of money that we have to spend on testing. So the, the point of identifying a BRCA mutation in, a, in an individual is that it allows them to make a number of decisions about their future health. I guess if you took a young 20, 25-year-old who was unaffected, they can begin to understand what their breast cancer risk is relative to the population risk. So this is a graph showing the cumulative risk of an unaffected carrier of developing breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, and this is for BRCA1 on the left and BRCA2 on the right. So you can see that at, at around the age of 20, in bold is your breast cancer risk, and over here is the population risk for breast cancer. Your risk is, is a good five times the population, five to six, six times the population risk. And as you get older, that risk relative to the population will come down. And in fact, I can say, say to you that they do cross at around the age of 70. So if you a BRCA mutation carrier, by the time you hit 70, your risk is no longer greater than the population. And that's simply because the population risk due to ageing um, and accumulation of DNA mutations will, will eventually catch up. But certainly at this sort of age, your risk is much, much higher. So you may wish to make decisions um, and we'll talk a bit though about those in the next slide. Looking at the ovarian cancer risk, again, that's a lot higher. In fact, the, the baseline for ovarian cancer is around that 1%, so it's very close to the bottom. So you can see that the risk is some 30 times higher than the population risk, so it's much, much higher. And, and it stays higher right throughout the lifetime. And so um, we certainly do recommend intervening at around this, this age uh, for ovarian cancer. Well, again, we'll talk about that in the next slide. For BRCA2, the breast cancer risk is pretty similar. You can see there's not a lot of difference. Um, and, but interestingly, the ovarian cancer risk is a lot lower for the BRCA2 gene. So the management, a, a, a woman who has found to carry a BRCA mutation really has the choice of undergoing high-risk surveillance. So this would be regular clinical examinations at a high-risk clinic and imaging once a year. And that, depending on their age, uh, it may be a combination of mammograms and MRI and plus or minus ultrasound. We would suggest starting at, we would look at the family history, and if there's someone that's very young, you would start five years younger than that. It's unusual, though, to see a breast cancer in relation to a, a BRCA gene mutation under 30, so we tend to start at 30 in most families. And then the preventative side of things will be a combination of medical prevention or chemo prevention, which is really these days tamoxifen, so when chemo is not a great word, actually. It's not chemotherapy. It's medication that can be used to prevent. Tamoxifen um, can be used to prevent breast cancer, so in an unaffected woman. The uptake of tamoxifen, though, the number of women who actually use it is not high, particularly in young women, because it does cause menopausal symptoms, 
which is obviously not, not fun to have. And there are long-term risks of uh, you know, increased risks of blood clots and other factors. So um, still a, a difficult one to toss up whether to use it or not. The other option, the alternative to surveillance, is to have a risk-reducing bilateral mastectomy, so removal of both breasts. It doesn't buy you zero cancer risk, but it does bring it down to, I think most surgeons would quote 1% or less, which is obviously lower than the general population risk. So it does buy you peace of mind. We actually don't promote one over the other. We, we leave it up to people to choose. This route means that you could still be diagnosed with the cancer, but we, we realise that with, um, I guess, awareness, vigilance, close in examination, if we are going to detect a breast cancer, we're going to pick it up early. And with breast cancer, if you pick it up early, the cure rates are high, approaching 100%. So your survival is good. This option reduces your risk, but is associated with time off work, uh, potentially pain, complications of infection, bleeding. So uh, again, it's, it's something that a woman has to make a personal decision about. With the um, removal of ovaries and tubes, that's salpingo oophorectomy. This is a, a very difficult decision because removing your ovaries, obviously that's the end of your childbearing. So generally most women would delay that until after completion of childbearing. And then second of all, you will go into an early menopause. And we've started to realise that early menopause itself is associated with long-term health problems. And so one has to make a, a decision about when is the best time. There is no effective surveillance for ovarian cancer at this point in time. So the recommendation is that all women do consider this and from those sorts of ages seems to be the best, uh, I guess, weighing up time or balancing act. I just wanted to sh illustrate or show you that the BRCA genes talk to a whole lot of other tumour suppressor and DNA repair genes. So there's a whole pathway. And now that genetic technology is improving, we're starting to realise that there are changes in these other genes, but they're very rare, but they do contribute to inherited breast cancer. These are just some examples, and some of them will be associated with particular syndromes that we recognise. So quickly is an approach to inherited bowel cancer. So what I want to talk about here is the concept of the adenoma-carcinoma sequence. An adenoma really means a polyp, a polyp in the bowel. All cancers begin as a polyp. And once again, that adenoma, the polyp to cancer sequence, is caused by a series of mut acquired mutations that occur over time. It is thought that from polyp formation to cancer takes around 15 to 20 years. So it's a slow, gradual evolution. Um, and the fundamental is, is if you would have regular screening via colonoscopy and remove polyps, you can therefore prevent cancer. Now, the problem is, well, I mean, it's probably advised in everybody in the general population to consider having a colonoscopy after 50, but unfortunately the, the access and the availability is limited, so that's probably not the advice. And, and you will hear about, for example, fecal oncal blood testing, which gives you an indication of a bleeding polyp or an early cancer. But we, with familial cancer, we try and identify those considered at high risk of developing bowel cancer such that it is worth doing colonoscopies because for two reasons. Either they've got so many polyps in their bowel that one is eventually going to turn cancerous, you just can't keep tabs on all of them, or your DNA repair genes have mutations such that that polyp to carcinoma sequence becomes accelerated. So instead of 15 to 20 years, it could become cancerous within a year or two. So those are, that's where we spend our time investigating bowel cancer. So your multiple polyposis syndromes and this particular condition called Lynch syndrome, which is probably the commonest inherited cause of bowel cancer, which accelerates the polyp to carcinoma sequence. Another group are of unusual, very rare types of polyps that in themselves can turn cancerous much faster. And there are a number of polyposis syndromes, which I'm not going to talk about today. So... The typical inherited polyposis syndrome is called familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP for short, caused by mutations in another tumor suppressor gene called APC. And clinically, it presents with hundreds of polyps in the bowel, literally more than 100. The polyp is really a coating of the lining of the bowel, easily detected on colonoscopy, may never present with any symptoms preceding, and often may present with cancer 
quite often in the 20s or 30s before an individual even is aware that they have polyps. Um, if we know someone is at risk, say through predictive genetic testing, then we would start surveillance in the teenage years and usually the polyps would begin around that 16 years of age. So here, this is a condition that's entirely, cancer is entirely preventable by setting up a surveillance program. One of the problems with FAP is that the number of polyps become so great that most patients will end up having to have their bowel removed as a preventative, probably by their 20s or 30s, to, just to get control over the number of polyps. But at least then cancer is prevented. Lynch syndrome is, is caused by DNA repair genes. Now, Lynch syndrome is it's a syndrome because it actually features more than just bowel cancer. For men and women, there's both bowel and stomach cancer, and the risk is as high as 80% for bowel cancer over the lifetime. But for women, there are additional cancer risks in the womb, the uterine cancer, and also in the ovaries. The uterine cancer is significant, so when we see a combination of these sorts of cancers in a family, we would definitely think about Lynch syndrome. The thing about Lynch syndrome is that unlike BRCA, where we really have to look at a family history to try and make a call of whether there's a mutation, we've actually developed ways of predicting Lynch syndrome based on testing the tumour, which is much easier to access than an individual, particularly if the pathologist is cooperative. And in fact, in WA, we've now set up a program, and you may not be aware of this, but anybody who presents with bowel cancer under 60 will have these screening tests for Lynch syndrome. We can proudly say that we're the only state that has a, a routine screening program. Other states still have a rather haphazard practice. There are two tests that we can do. One is a molecular test called microsatellite testing, and that's really just an indication of DNA repair defects within, this, within the tissue. The test that's probably preferred by most pathologists is something called immunohistochemistry, which is really a, just an antibody to the, to the proteins produced by the, the DNA repair genes. And the premise being that if the protein's working normally, our antibody will stain and it'll pick up nicely, and that's a normal result. But if the antibody is not latching to its protein, it implies that there's something wrong with the protein, and therefore there could be an underlying fault, a mutation. And those, those cases need to be investigated. So it's kind of as a screening test. It helps to sieve out which cases we should see in the population. Anybody with a family history should have this sort of testing as well of, that, that fits. So these are the... So just quickly, the, the management for Lynch syndrome would include general measures to reduce your bowel cancer risk. So, and these could apply to anybody in the population for, in terms of bowel cancer, reducing your dietary fibre... Sorry, increasing that why I said reducing, increasing your dietary fiber. Aspirin is another medication that's been shown to reduce the number of polyps in the bowel, and there is evidence that in Lynch syndrome it reduces colorectal cancer risk. I've put an asterisk there because aspirin does have side effects, and I think you need to weigh that up with your GP before going on to aspirin. The dose itself is still being evaluated as to what the best dose is. Currently we're recommending 100 milligrams. But the key, the cornerstone really, is, is annual colonoscopy. So Frequent colonoscopy is much more frequent than we would recommend in the general population to, to monitor and remove any polyps as they occur because of that acceleration in the polyp to cancer sequence. And then for women, um, again, because there's a lack of screening tests, we would recommend that they consider prophylactic surgery uh, after completion of their childbearing. So in a family with bowel cancer... <clears throat> What sort of things do we think of? Once again, it's the old rule of multiple cases of bowel cancer within, an, in, within a family, particularly if there's a young age, under 50. At the very least, we would do some Im that immunohistochemistry testing on someone with bowel cancer to look for evidence of Lynch. Again, if someone's had one bowel cancer and then years later they get a new one, or there are multiple polyps. So there we would be thinking about the polyposis syndromes. So that's a fairly a big clue. But if there's those mixtures of the Lynch cancers, bowel, womb, and ovarian cancer, then we would be thinking about Lynch. Or if anybody, for whatever reason, has had a screening test, and as I said, if you're under 60 in the, in the population and you've had bowel cancer, we'll automatically do that. Those are uh, another test for, for Lynch. And just again to reiterate that, again, while bowel cancer, the, about 5% of the population will get bowel cancer, this represents that 5%. It's only a very small proportion, again, around 5 to 10% of the 5% that are due to inherited causes with Lynch 
So it's an, uh, HMPCC is an old term for Lynch syndrome, APC being that, that familial adenopatous polyposis, and then there are a group of other genes that we're sort of just starting to understand. So a couple of minutes before I end off, just to talk a bit about genetic services of WA. We're divided into three sections. One of our sections is devoted to inherited cancers. We're called the Familial Cancer Program. We're made up of a multidisciplinary team of staff, geneticists such as myself. Most contact of you ever to come to the FCP will be probably with the genetic counsellor. These are uh, people with nursing or science or counselling backgrounds that have then done a, a master's in genetics, and so they, I guess they cross uh, a number of disciplines but are really good at talking to people about inherited conditions. Our role in the Familial Cancer Program is two things, really. We, one is that we will provide a risk assessment. So even if we don't believe there is a single inherited gene in the family, based on the family history, we would make an assessment of your risk. Usually population risk, the same as everybody in the population, moderately increased or high increased risk. And we would recommend a surveillance program based on that risk. We would provide support and information to families uh, about their risk assessment and then if we believe that genetic testing may actually be beneficial in a family, we think it's likely to find something that will do some good, then we will go through with them uh, whether genetic testing is possible and what the benefits and risks are. Just as just an example of a, some of the tools that we use, this is particularly useful for, for you to sit down with your GP, but something called Frabock, which is an online tool that by Cancer Australia, that, that can actually, you can plug in your family tree and we'll actually work out uh, what risk category you fall into. Um, this one's actually a little bit superseded, so I would recommend that one. It should be online for you. Now, with genetic testing, there, there's a lot to the decision-making. It's not just a blood test, and so our counsellors will go through the logistics of testing, the timing, how long it will take. What are you going to do if you test positive? Have you thought about screening, surveillance, surgical? How is it going to impact on your lifestyle? Very importantly, what is the impact on life insurance, income protection insurance? Because if you go from a healthy person to someone at risk of cancer, this can have an impact. And then um, what are the inheritance and reproductive options to, to your offspring if you test positive? Coping with the result, decision-making, anxiety, uncertainty, all of this needs to be to ma manage very carefully, putting it into perspective. So all of this, our counsellors will go through. So quite often an appointment to have a predictive test for a particular mutation in the family can take a good hour of going through all of these. Will you be able to cope with the risk? What are your, what are your coping mechanisms going to be? And if, even if you test negative, we see that people in siblings, for example, who have testing, the negative one feels extremely guilty and parents who pass on the gene mutation. And then what will it mean in the future? So coming back to Angelina, she's had a profound effect on our service. This is about when she made her announcement in May of mid-May of 2013. And what you can see in blue was we were hovering around the 50 referrals a month, up sometimes a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower. Um, the following year, in 2000, sorry, the, so in 2000, and so blue was the original 2012 pre-Angelina, but when Angelina made her decision, look at the skyrocket in, in referrals. So a huge increase, three to four times the number of, five times the number of referrals. And now, if you look at our latest figures from last year in green, they're still well above the original baseline. So we've had a number of huge number of referrals from GPs and, and patients out there. And many of the referrals are, are, are correct and appropriate, but many are also inappropriate. Where I guess what we're hoping that the first port of call is still through your GP to sit down and make an assessment of your family tree. So to, finally, to come back to the, the question, if I've got cancer in my family, should I panic? Do I need a test? What should I do? Well, hopefully through what I've been through what I've explained today, I don't think that you should immediately panic. The answer is it's probably not going to be an inherited syndrome. I've shown you that they are rare and that a sequence of events needs to occur. However, there are going to be red flags in a family, and if you see these, it is worth going to your GP. So again, much of the same themes. If you've got the same sort of cancer running through your family, thinking about that family tree that I show, or associated cancers you've learned today about breast and ovarian cancer, 
clustering or bowel, womb and ovarian, any of those combinations, it's, it's certainly worth going to your GP about. Anybody with young cancer, um, certainly under 50 is a guided rule, but for the common cancers like breast cancer, under 40 is probably more realistic. If one person has multiple cancers and if they're young, and if you're Jewish and you have a history of breast or ovarian cancer. So hopefully you've got an understanding of our approach to inherited cancers. And um, I'm sure that that's probably generated one or two questions. So at this point, I will uh, open it to the floor. So thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Nick. That was really fantastic. Um, we've got, probably got a few minutes now for some questions. And we do have our roving microphone, if anyone would like to, to put their hand up. Yeah, we've got one up the back. We'll just wait for the microphone because it, it just... No, it's, it's for the recording on the internet. I really need you to, to speak into the microphone. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Patcher. Look, I might be off beam here because I, I think I'm interested in another form of testing, but perhaps you might be able to guide me a little bit. Um, I've got lung cancer, and a lot of people talk to me about getting genetic testing that will guide treatment, not diagnosis. Can you help me with that at all? Yeah, so what you're, you're talking about is what I showed in the early slides. So is to look at your tumour, so somatic testing, so testing for somatic mutations, because that will give you the mechanism for your, what's led to your lung cancer. And I, I guess the thought of the belief now is, is if we can identify what those molecular causes are, we can target them. So we try and target or narrow our treatments to those specific targets. So, for example, in lung cancer, there are certain molecular targets that can be applied. So that doesn't imply an inherited cause, but it, it can certainly assist you with treatment. So we, in inherited cancer, we don't manage that side at all. That's left, the oncologists would generally be the, the doctors that would involve that. But it is for lung cancer, there are some mutations now with, with targeted therapy, so it's worth asking your oncologist. Just wondering if um, esophageal melanoma is an inherited disease? Esophageal melanoma? Melanoma, yeah. Okay. So that implies that it has to be of the squamous epithelium because the esophagus has actually got two parts. I mean, it's unusual because it's melanoma, the primary risk factor is sun exposure, and so you obviously you've got an area that's not exposed to sun. I mean, esophageal cancer in general we don't often see as being genetic because it's usually environmental toxin-related. Um, melanoma itself, um, partially genetic, particularly if it's an unusual area. So esophageal melanoma, and I haven't come across that specifically in the syndromes that I look at, but it's probably worth exploring a bit more. It is a, it's a bit unusual. Yeah, my dad died of, of it, and yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, whether... I mean, I mean, cancer genetics is all about discovering. So, you know, if we haven't heard of it before, we can certainly look into to very rare presentations like that. So, yeah, it's probably worth you. going to your GP and exploring the rest of the family tree as well. Hi. Um, I had a sister who had ovarian cancer, very young, 34. And then I had another sister who had bowel cancer at 40, 49. I've looked back in family history, but on one side of my mother's family, I can't really look back too far because the records are gone. They were in Ireland, and they had a huge fire, and lots of things have gone missing. In my father's side, I've traced an aunt with uterine cancer, but I haven't really tra uh, traced anything else other than that. So I really don't know if I should still be genetically tested. I have colonoscopies every three years, and I have a mammogram every year. So okay. I still really don't know if I should go ahead and get tested. Well, as, as I've tried to show you today, the problem is that we wouldn't be able to offer you testing being unaffected. We wouldn't right. be able to interpret your results. We okay. would have a better chance of interpreting results if we could have tested one of those family members that had any of those cancers because hopefully you've all appreciated from that family history that that's sounding like Lynch syndrome. Yeah. I was and told that my, both of them were inherited cancers. That's what I was told. Okay. Um, 
You know, so yeah, I think so it's, a, it's a combination of being unable to interpret and, and just the, unfortunately the cost of testing. We, we, we cannot test every unaffected person in the population. I think when things advance and uh, genetic testing is more widespread and cheaper, I think we'll get to a point and people can decide if they want this or not, but you will be tested for a number of genes which potentially could include inherited cancer genes to guide your future health. But we're not at that point in time yet. Your best bet is to continue with, with the surveillance and if another family member pops up with something that fits with Lynch syndrome, we could then investigate that person. We'll call it. Uh, we'll call it an afternoon, but I think that's just really opened the door on on a, a, a better knowledge of genetics and the complicated nature of of cancer and genetics. So I hope that's um, really answered some questions for you today. And just please join me once again in th thanking Dr. Patchdale. <laughs>